you all out there. I'd like to introduce my next guest on episode number two. My next guest, she's been an agent uh, for a couple of years. Uh, really hit the scene focusing on investment properties. And, you know, when I first met her, I can see that she was seriously about her business and making things happen. And so, you know, I know that there's other people that aspire to to get into real estate and work with investors and I thought she would be the best person to hear her story and motivate others. We have to my side right here, Dominique. Say your Caminos. name. Caminos, yes, there we Dominique go. Caminos. You could tell I'm nervous, goddamn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Dominique, thank you. Welcome to the show. Yes, thanks for having me. I'm excited. That's good, that's good. So um I want people to get an opportunity to like know who you are and like, know why you decided in real estate. But uh, I want to take you back to Katie High School. Tell me a little bit about who you were back then. Oh, God. I mean, I, I grew up really in inner city Houston, mm-hmm. so... I wouldn't even consider myself the outskirts Katie girl. Um, (laughs) I lived there for about two years. Um, But, you know, a lot of change happened. Um, I was a teen mom when Mm. I was 17 years old. I had my oldest daughter, Mm -hmm. um, which completely changed my mindset of life um, and allowed me to you know, expand my thought process. And so I think, honestly, the way I think and the reason why I'm in real estate all started from being a young mom and Mm. and thinking bigger, you know, and real estate is what's bigger. It is what's bigger. I mean, a lot of millionaires and billionaires have a real estate portfolio. Um, Let's talk about teen parenthood because I was a teen parent too. Mm -hmm. And so like, that moment you found out, oh, man, I'm going to be a mom. Was it scary? I mean, coming from the big city, sometimes we have that attitude like, I don't care. I'm just going whatever. But yeah. how did you feel? Um, <clears throat> Well, I, I was raised in a single parent household as well. So, you know, I give big props to my mom. Mm-hmm. Education was never not an option. Uh, um, And so, yes, there's this stigma on me that, oh, goodness, look at this 17 girl, 17 year old girl. She's not even out of high school. She's pregnant. Right. Whoop de whoop, all that great stuff. Um, But um, I'm I like to say I'm pretty resilient. Like I, mm. I don't really get overwhelmed very easily or feel bottled down. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think also it helps being raised in an environment where you've seen your mom struggle. You've mm. seen, you know, she's later on in life trying to get her education, trying to pick herself up. Um, mm-hmm. And I knew that couldn't be me. So, yeah. you know, it just it made me be way more focused in college. I didn't have the opportunity to be in college and buck, get buck wild, you Man. know. Did you pledge in college? Oh, no, oh, no, okay. no, 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 no. Right. Who had time for that? Heck no. I actually lived in Kentucky. I moved. Whoa, the bluegrass yeah. state. Like, what was that like coming from <laughs> Houston to Kentucky? Culture shock, okay. Um, but it was a perfect opportunity. I lived in a small town called Owensboro, Kentucky. Hmm. Um, they're about 10 years behind in everything. Oh, so wow. That was exciting. <laughs> they were still wearing cross colors or something. Oh, Lord. Uh, but, it, again, it allowed me to be focused, raise my child. Yeah. build a community uh, it prepared me for the real world ah. uh, demographics wise and so yeah you know everything happens how that work i mean i was a, a teen parent i went away to college however like i didn't have my kid with yeah. me you had to have your daughter with you on campus like uh-huh. find sitters and stuff like that mm-hmm. man how challenging was that um i let's see i knew i was gonna make it like mm. that just that wasn't an option to fail so, um, actually, I, f- I ended up going to Kentucky because they had a program for parents going to school full time. Uh-huh. So this program allowed me to go to school and they had a daycare in the uh, near the apartment complex, like walking distance. So mm-hmm. I was able to drop her off all day as I was in school. But if I ever needed additional support, um, my campus was very involved in my life and also... Owensboro was a type of city or town, per se, that you could go in there and you'd be at the park and a family would be like, oh, my gosh, come over for dinner. And oh, wow. Yeah, it, <laughs> it was literally a community. And Man. I literally met one of Aaliyah's babysitters through what? the park. They were sitting next to us and um, they were like, your daughter's so beautiful. And then from there. 
They they helped me when I had my night classes and everything. So you had like a community in that mm-hmm. small community. And mm-hmm. sometimes that's the benefit of like being there it versus is. being in a huge city. Exactly. So, um, you know, it was you. Uh, how many siblings do you have? There is four, five of us. Okay, I have okay. a twin, I have an older sister, and I have two younger sisters. Sabrina's your twin? No, Sabrina uh-huh. is the second to youngest. But uh-huh. me and Sabrina, Sabrina do look the most yeah, alike. I was like, is this her twin right now? <laughs> <laughs> we get it all the time. But no, my, my Gabby is my twin. Identical? We're fraternal. Oh, man. But we're all, the unique thing about us is each one of our grandparents are a different ethnicity, so... Mm-hmm. All of us have different skin tones, different hair textures. Oh, wow. um, we all look different. So they didn't even believe you all. Like, oh, no. <laughs> we had to, like, show our IDs and prove that we're sisters. It's a lot. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, well, what is May 12th? If I say that date, what does that mean to you? That's my birthday. What? Taurus gang, gang, gang. <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought you were, like, Gemini, but, like, okay. What? Okay. No, no. <laughs> I gave you Gemini vibes? Nah, nah, you didn't. Definitely, you didn't. You had one face all the time. I tried to. I was like, hold on. All right, good, good. And then from college, um, you know, what what did you study? Mm, I went to school. Originally, I went into education. Okay. Um, I still want to teach eventually, but um, then I ended up just changing my degree to uh, PR and marketing. Mm, okay, okay. Yeah. Good, good. So um, you wanted to teach and, you know, as an, an agent, we teach people a lot. Mm-hmm. Like it's a part of our profession. But let's fast forward a little bit. Let's talk about uh, coming from Houston and moving to Austin. Mm-hmm. And at that point, like what was that key moment that you felt like before that? OK, you come to Austin. What were you doing? What, what, what were you working? Um, I, my background is in professional development, diversity, Mm. equity, and inclusion work. So, uh, before I moved here, I worked for a relationship intelligence company called Core Strengths, Mm. um, teaching pretty much collaboration within the workplace. Mm. Um, and then when COVID hit professional development, I was in a cold territory Okay. and, um, professional development was like the first budget to get cut. Right. Ah, Um, And I've worked for big entities like Franklin Covey. Um, mm-hmm. They wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People um, and so on. And I'm like, okay, I really loved challenging the whole person and mm-hmm. shifting paradigms. However, I didn't want that connection of corporate America being tied to it. Mm-hmm. If I want to focus on a whole person, let me do that. So when I moved to Austin, I decided to get my master's. Like, why not in this mm-hmm. time? Um, when people were now forced to kind of shift with COVID, you know, um, I was like, okay, I'm gonna get my master's in counseling Hmm. and I did marriage and and families because it gives you the systemic view of how a person is wired based on their environment, self and so on, Mm -hmm. um, which aligns with my certifications. Um, so I knew that I still wanted to do consulting and counseling work, Mm -hmm. but as I was getting my education, uh, my hustle mode is like, uh, I'm going to be an agent like everybody else in a mama. Okay? <laughs> Let me just have that on my background. And um, I did it not thinking it might just be like a part time thing. Oh, mm-hmm. if I make if I sell one property a month. Great. Uh, I, so you broke down the math like, OK, yeah. if I could do this, then yeah. that'll be good mm-hmm. supplemental income. huh? Yeah, I'm great. at making relationships. I'm mm-hmm. good at selling. So why not? It wasn't really like. I'm going to do this full time. Did somebody like inspire you or kind of like nudge you and say, hey, you should do this? Or was it just. No, I, I guess with COVID, I it made me think about, you know, OK, I'm a mom. I have a lot of things I want to do. I want to create a soft life. I want to be able to travel um, with my kids. But um, how can I do that mm-hmm. with without multiple streams of income? Mm. Um, and so when I was thinking about school and yeah, I have a long term goal with that real estate is something that will always be there. I get my license. Mm-hmm. Um, if something happens, another pandemic, God forbid, or right. I lose a job, whatever that looks like, I can I can have that as a fallback option. Mm-hmm. I don't need a contract. I don't need anything. Right. Um, so that's what made me get into real estate. Um, one of the things that you know attracted me to real estate, it was just basically that's a profession where 
you create your own schedule, but also you make as much as you are willing to hustle. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you're like if you're a go getter getter and you're like burning the midnight oil all the time and you're just studying and you're reaching out like you can make money. But if you want to work two hours a day and make just enough or whatever that yields for you, then you're OK with that. Are you similar with that? Like, yeah, real estate is definitely what you put into it, mm-hmm. um, which is why I thought I was going to do the bare minimum. <laughs> Not gonna lie, y'all. When you get that first check, you like, hold on. <laughs> you get addicted. Like, okay, Whoa. you think I? You know what? Let me forget, forget uh, my part time job. How can I do this? <laughs> right, uh, like that. Yeah, it's it's definitely what you put into it, but it's extremely rewarding. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not gonna lie. I work long hours. Mm-hmm. I have a very unique schedule, mm-hmm. um, especially working with investors. But I'm sure it's the same way with buyers. You have to be on call. Yeah. And the thing is, is not your typical hours they're available on weekends and evenings because they have a job um most of the time so it's you know your your schedule is a little it's you're literally on call 24 7 yeah it's like a a practitioner a doctor Mm -hmm. or something so let's talk a little bit about um do you remember that first transaction (laughs) (laughs) uh i yes yes actually i do who is that person or don't say their name was yeah. it was it a, like a a family an investor or um no so i was referred to her by somebody they found me in um portland i believe or oregon wow we were in the same um brokerage um and crazy story was she, this was when interest rates were really low but she was hmm. pr- her budget was lower uh. and i was like dang okay we gotta find her her perfect home with the budget but (laughs) every house was like in the 400s at this point in the outskirts you know um so anyways um i'm i'm a great networker Uh so i noticed a house was under well it was for sale across the street from me Ah. and i was like hmm let me call this agent and like be his bff (laughs) and we we him started talking. I'm like, you know, your house is overpriced, and it really was. It wasn't like a tactic to make him go down. Mm-hmm. Um, I even offered to open houses for him, stuff like that, and he wasn't getting attraction. Mm. So I'm like, I called him. I was like, so, what if I tell you I I can get you a buyer, but you need to go down significantly in your price, mm. but we'll go under contract like today if wow. you do it. And I told her, I was like, I need you to come look at this house. And I was like, dang, do I want my client to be my neighbor? (laughs) Literally, I walk out my house and she's across the street from me. (sighs) But I loved her. Like, we started talking about life very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so, anyways, we went under contract. Now she's my neighbor. Look at that. See? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, that's going above and beyond because you could have just sent her a list knowing that she couldn't really afford too much. But that was kind of clever. Like, sometimes it just hits you like, hmm, let me try this. And that works out. But being like a therapist and being an agent, like, how do those coincide? Yeah, I I think it makes people feel safe with you, right? Like, Mm -hmm. um, honestly, real estate is a very personal game. Mm -hmm. Even if it's with investors, um, it's about wealth for them, right? So if you're able to speak people's language and connect with them and also understand how their communication style works, mm-hmm. then you'll be able to achieve the goals with them mm-hmm. versus trying to figure them out. You know, I've had the being able to have the opportunities to mm-hmm. know some some people want things thorough. Some people just want the numbers. Like just mm-hmm. I don't need all the Fluff. extra stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just give me a, a, a range and I'm good. Mm-hmm. Um, where some people are like, this is a emotional for me mm-hmm. um so really as a realtor you have to be able to connect yeah. the dots um and see what people want from you and then especially once you with investors you're doing multiple transactions mm-hmm. with them mm-hmm. you you do become partners yeah. you do become friends per se they become a part of the family you know, yeah so yeah, you hear about their personal life, mm-hmm. you hear about stuff like that. And so at the end of the day, people are going to continue doing um, business with people they like. Great, great. So let's talk a little bit about, um, so that was like the first, she might have been a first time home buyer, mm-hmm. possibly. But let's talk about um, networking. Like, how is that for you? How are you, you know, successful at doing that? Well, I am a fairly new agent, people would say, mm-hmm. um, and my success comes from being creative. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually got one of my first, well, 
my main big investor from doing uh, interviewing them, uh, interviewing mm. investors. Me and a friend of mine, we were like, okay, how can we grow a business to do something that, that somebody nobody else is doing? And it's mm. like, let's go around and teach people different ways to invest in real estate. It's ah. not just flipping, it's not just wholesaling. There's so many different ways that you can do that and tools that you can utilize. Um, and from there, um, investors just liked me. Hmm. So, <laughs> uh, and then um, I made goals. Like in the summertime, I attended about three to four biz, uh, networking events every week. Wow. Um, I wanted to be known, um, you know, in places where I stand out like a sore thumb. I made hmm. sure that that's what it was. And here in Austin, like people of ethnicity kind of stand out like a sore thumb in places. How do you, um, you know, and I don't know, maybe it's your big city background, but like if I saw you across the room, I would think oh, she may be kind of shy. Like, how do you overcome that and just start opening your mouth? Well, I usually when I go to my networking events, I wear my hair big. Uh, so people will be like, oh, my God, I love your hair. And so my hair is my superpower. I actually made a post. It's like, what's your superpower? What makes you stand out when you go? Some people wear glasses. Some people wear funky socks, shoes. Yeah. Mine is my hair. Um, nice. Mine is my ethnicity. I know it. that sounds crazy to say, but especially in the investor world, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of women, mm -hmm. um, and specifically people of color, mm -hmm. in that arena. And so for me, it's like, I'm. you're going to know my face. Mm, and I will look completely different. Yeah, they will remember you, yeah. especially if yeah. you have your hair big and like coming so the it attracts people yeah. so the key is not necessarily if you're shy what's an innovative way that you can attract people to mm -hmm. you not you necessarily having to say hi first that's good that's good that's mm -hmm. the thing as an agent you want to be sought after and not have to chase people exactly. but you use the word attract right and so like as a woman in business mm -hmm. like you attract good attention bad attention attention with bad intentions oh yeah like how do you navigate through that um for one i know this sounds bad but little cues like you walk in like you don't play <laughs> um, number one and two is that you're it it's inevitable like it, you're not it's going to happen right but you have to stay firm into your boundaries you mm -hmm. have to always redirect um and not all business is good business i will walk away if somebody's disrespectful to me uh, um i will set those boundaries immediately but you also have to know it's a superpower too right uh, um so understanding that it could be some blurred lines there but as long as you're staying true to yourself and honoring your boundaries, mm -hmm. work the room. Okay, good. Work it, you know? You don't use that uh, methodology of you have to flirt to convert, do you? No, 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 no. <laughs> right, but cool. I do think that because your reputation is on the line, yes. right? Like, you don't want to be that girl that's, you know, out there. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're good looking, you're already a target. But mm -hmm. you want to be friendly. At the end of the day, you're an entrepreneur, right? Yeah, exactly. Be about your business. Be presentable. Um, be a safe place for people, but also be the person that people respect, mm -hmm. you know? All right, gather around, girls and boys. It's time for another segment of Confessions of an Austin Age. Yeah, you can see I'm, I'm trying to get my voice to sound like Vincent Price when he uh, narrated Thriller, <laughs> but I probably need a little work. But anyway, let me get to this, this tale here. Um, early years as an agent, I had an assistant. Now, my assistant, again, I'm going to leave out names and gender, race, etc. for the innocent. Um, but I had this assistant. And this assistant was, I found him virtually, was from Mississippi, had a sweet Southern draw, very like, like apple pie. And um, so anyway, as this assistant made calls for me, she set up some appointments that like took me into rural areas. And the one time I went to a client's house, um, <laughs> knocked on the door, I made sure, usually I dress kind of low-key, but I made sure I, I looked like an important businessman on this, this trip. I knocked on the door, and as soon as the guy opened his eyes, like, it was like, they almost jumped out of his face. He saw me and was like, whoa, put his hands out, stop, who are you? And I'm like, hey, hey, it's, it's Andre Key, like, you have an appointment with me. And he, like, held the screen door, appointment what are you talking about 
and I said, oh, I see what's happening. So I took out my business card, was like, that's me, the real estate agent. The sweet lady that made the appointment for us to meet works for me. Um, so he kind of like had me slide the card through the door, looked at it. Needless to say, I, you know, I was able to sit down in his home, get the tour, have the presentation. I mean, he didn't go with me. I could have probably converted it, but I think I almost made him have a heart attack. And so that is another confession of an Austin agent. Let's talk about uh, switching over to the investment side and working with investors. Like, I talked to you. I've had a conversation. I think one of your superpowers is evaluating deals. So let's mm-hmm. talk about how you were able to learn how to do that and, like, you know, how did you make that one of your superpowers? Um, luckily, that my background is in edu- not education in corporate mm. <clears throat> business development um, okay. and so on. And so analyzing is one of my my strategies. I love problem solving. Um, mm. And I realized quickly, maybe buyers are not for me. Oh. Um, from one is it, it was a lot. Um, this market is very unique um, and it's hard to get people to understand um, the realism behind the market, yeah, especially like two years ago, one and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I was very intrigued by the thought of investing, mm-hmm. and what can that look like for me in the future? Well, to do that, you have to sit down with the right people. Mm-hmm. You have to walk properties with these investors. You got to ask them about their tools. How do they get here? What do you do? Well, how do you know this is worth what? Um, and so the way my brain is wired, I love solving problems. Good. I love understanding the logistics behind things. Mm-hmm. So after a while, I just started looking at how to accurately price properties, mm. um, but also being able to look at rehab properties and analyze the numbers and what what is it right now? What is it worth after it's being rehab? How mm-hmm. much is the rehab budget? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I knew that a lot of these brokers are heavily focused on buyers and sellers only, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I'm like, gosh, I got to get away from this because mm-hmm. I am like about business. Yeah. I don't, I can create my own brand. I know how to network and I help put myself out there. I found a broker. I'm with McLean Realty. Mm-hmm. Um, and he is left brain heavy like me. So, you know, <laughs> we will be doing calculations for our meetings. Nice. Um, yeah, like cap rates, um, how to analyze a property. Um, what do you do when you're comparing properties? The formula, subtracting, adding this. Look at the square foot. Look at this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was like, yes, everything might what my brain needed. <laughs> um, so really having the right brokerage or the right team, per se, mm-hmm. um, who can help you. Um, think the way that you think like what is not everybody wants to work like me Mm -hmm. you know on average last week from my investor I pulled over 20 properties wow um and I'm doing the research behind all of them Mm -hmm. right and so that's a lot of work to analyze and run numbers um so yeah but the thing is with investors they're gonna buy probably multiple properties a year versus Mm -hmm. A single, you know, first time home buyer or second right. or third, they may buy a home every four to seven years right. if you're lucky. And there's no guarantee they're going to think about you in seven years. So, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're good at what you do, mm-hmm. right, I believe one thing I did learn from Franklin Covey is excellence, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going to do something, do it well. And it doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but be willing to grow and learn. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you are, providing opportunities for these investors mm-hmm. if you're advocating for them um being like no this is not a good deal i have no problem telling people and get on the phone and mm-hmm. running through numbers with them um they're going to keep you so nice. like one of my main clients right now he's looking to purchase minimum 50 properties in one year nice. um mm-hmm. it's a lot of work though yeah. that's just one client yeah. so you know um some people like that's all they need <laughs> that, yeah yeah again <laughs> Again, it's addicting, right? Yeah. Because you're like, oh, one property a month. Oh, that's now like, okay, that's doable. And then you're like, hold on, but I can make more money yeah. with more clients. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about this. Let's let's switch the subject a little bit. Because when you work with investment properties, mm-hmm. there a lot of them are super ugly. Like, yeah. just like torn down, doors hanging off the hinges. Mm-hmm. 
um, I've dealt with a lot of hoarders. Like, what is mm-hmm. the worst property you ever stepped foot in? I didn't step foot in it, but I worked it. It was mm. a hoarder. He was um, disabled um, with no assistance at the house. Mm. So he had animals and himself, oh, wow. and there was like feces everywhere. Oh. Um, I mean, he couldn't move. He couldn't take care mm. of himself and then have help. So the property was just disgusting. It had to be completely wow. like gutted wow. and, you know, professionals come in and cleaned and mm. he didn't want to move. So I had to put in a really strict lease back to make sure that he moved. He had time to take all his stuff with him because they never want to part with that stuff. They don't want to part. So you <laughs> have to make it really like impossible for them mm. to stay. Um, and even then... It took him we like two weeks, I think, to get out of the property. Wow! But he had to cough up a lot of money, took and my investor was like, "Out of the way, thank Dominique, thanks." I'm like, "Yeah, no, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get paid if this is what's happening." So. Man, you definitely had to be a counselor that convincing the hoarder, like, "Hey, it's time to like." Well, you know, it was just like you can. And here's one of the greatest things that I've learned in life about connecting with people is that you can have empathy you can have compassion it doesn't Mm -hmm. mean you tolerate though right Right, right. so when you communicate in a way that's like i hear you and i'm sorry but Mm -hmm. hey unfortunately this is just what it is yeah there's it's a contract um so you know he wasn't mad or anything like that and we maintained a good you know communication and good relationship but i mean Empathy can go a long way, but sometimes it is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. You know what? I've been around a lot of people in my life, and I feel like I can, like, read characters. And, like, you have a nice smile, good presence, but I feel this sense of, like, no nonsense with you. Like, hey, sometimes (laughs) it's cut and dry. Like, take it or leave it. (laughs) Where did you establish that? Where did that come from? Okay, for real, though, I was a punk. I'm a natural punk. I cry. Oh, I'm no. an emotional gangster. Okay, that's what I tell I people. Can tell. <laughs> um, and you know, when I was in corporate America, like I was such a people pleaser, hmm. and I realized that I was making way more mistakes trying to please my team lead, or ah. you know, um, that I was like, I can't, I can't keep doing this. Hmm. Um, and I ended up doing the work. I. I knew my worth. Like, right. hold on. I hit circle of excellence every single year. I re- went from a 50% drop of retention to 97%. Hmm. Like, who who are you, Dominique? And I used to be very modest. Talk that corporate talk for okay. people. <laughs> you know, being modest is great. Like, I didn't like, don't compliment me. Like, yeah. you'd be like, Dominique, you look great. I'd be like, happy birthday. You know, like, <laughs> wow, this is awkward. Um, but learning, like, having confidence can sometimes make you seem like you're arrogant yeah. or you're full of yourself. And reality is like, no, I know my worth. And when you know your worth and when you're confident in the product that you have, which is yourself mm-hmm. and your brain or whatever specific um, gift that you are given, yeah. um, don't let nobody make you second guess yourself. Hmm. And people will. Yeah. You know, and so for me, I had to learn to have a backbone and be like, Sorry you feel that way, but this is just what it is. I mean, people will try to tear you down and make themselves feel better. And, you know, I'm sure you experience that. Um, But yeah, yeah, let's talk. Okay, let's go from business. Let's go, you know, a little bit personal again. Mm -hmm. So like having that type of confidence, having that like, of course, we all go in our room and cry at night sometimes. But when you out emotional gangster. Yeah, I see. I see. But then like. (laughs) Sometimes I'm sure when guys approach you, there's a level of attempt intimidation. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I I, I I have some female friends and they're like, hey, it's always the guy with no teeth, like has <laughs> nothing to lose. He'll approach me. But some other guys, they may be intimidated. Do you kind of get that or? Um, I'm a big believer of law of attraction. Like, don't get me uh, wrong. I do have guys that approach me that like. Shoot your shot, King. You know, you know he's gonna get rejected. But shoot your Do shot. Your thing. Hey. Um, but when honestly, when I found my worth, when I found my voice, um, mm-hmm. I feel as if what I attract is, I, I attract well balanced men. Mm-hmm. Like I don't um, have those really bad dating stories. Okay, good. Um, good. Yeah, no. Um, however, 
Um, I do get told a lot, like, uh, uh, <laughs> I, if I saw you, I probably wouldn't have approached you. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, you tucking uh, your tail, bro. What's going on? Yeah, but but <laughs> I'm getting the same feedback because it's intriguing for me to try to understand why. And it's, you know, uh, I look like I don't play. Like, pretty right, much it's right. like either come correct or don't come at all, yeah. which for me, fine. I weed out the week. Uh, the week. Like, yeah, I don't mind it. Yeah. So. <laughs> In, in reality, I'm really down to earth and really fun. Do and, you find yourself psychoanalyzing people, though, because uh, you have that skill set? You know, here's a dilemma. I <laughs> I get told that a lot, actually. Like, Dominique, stop psychoanalyzing me. Stop your thinking. <laughs> You're thinking. And I'm like, well, what's wrong with that? Mm. I'm, I'm observant, right? right. Um, and I want to understand you. Mm. I want to see your behaviors. I want to hear you talk. Mm. Um, so that I can have a deeper understanding of who you are and how to collaborate with you, or even if mm-hmm. I want to collaborate with you. Right. And, you know, at first I used to feel bad for for how I think, and it's, I mean, it's a blessing and a curse to be educated in those arenas. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then I'm like, I'm just aware. Hmm. Like, I'm aware of myself and other people. I'm aware of the type of personalities I want to be around right, right. and what I don't want to be around. Hmm. So, yes, I analyze, I listen. Do you I take that feedback, feedback the other, in the other direction? Oh, though? yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. good, good. But I am a huge, I told you I'm an emotional gangster, right? Right, right. So, for me, it's like, I conflict, um communicating through conflict is very important to me. Mm. So it's not that I can't receive feedback when it's, right. when it's given to me. It's just that just be honoring and respectful in that process. Mm. That's it. When was the last time you like, yeah, like, damn it. If you don't buy this house, I'm done. I'm firing you. Now my kids, like my three year old, I'd be ready to put Vaseline on. And <laughs> let me tell you, um, but like to a human, like a, an adult human. It's not like that. I don't, yeah, I, I don't really get angry like that. I mean, it's been a very long time since I've been just, like, outraged. All right. So, and, and you look very young. I, I think I, I see your birthday, but, like, my mom told me never to out a <laughs> woman's age. But, like, I'm sure some people, you may have gotten the old... Uh, Let's say, oh, white guy that's like, I've bought properties for yeah. 30 years and look at you like you don't mm-hmm. know shit. Like, how you deal with those guys? Mm, I had a guy specifically told me... He tell he told me that I was not allowed to set him up for success because I gave him feedback mm-hmm. on how he was communicating with people that I didn't think was appropriate. Um, and long story short, he pretty much told me that somebody like me, mm. half his age, has no right to set him up for success because that's offensive. Oh my god! Um, <laughs> and that was yeah. Um, here's the thing. <clears throat> you could get offended by it, or you mm-hmm. could kill them with kindness. Now, mm-hmm. I could be—I'm very firm in those places. I'm not—you're not going to get a reaction out of me. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to walk away from you. Mm-hmm. I'm going to stand right here. We're going to look at each other eye to eye. We're going to have a, a conversation, like and that. I'm not going to—you're not going to intimidate me. I like that. Um, and I just pretty much told him, like, I'm sorry that you feel that way. <laughs> I'm sorry that you're stumping your own growth because you think that somebody that is younger than you cannot help you grow. Mm. Um, because you obviously don't know the dynamic of a mentee and a mentor. Mm. Um, and it's based off expertise, not age. So nice. um, I just apologize for his limited. Damn, mindset. how'd you come up with that quick on the fly? <laughs> <laughs> like that. I really wanted to cut him out, but I was like, professionalism, Dominique. Damn, that he was. He wants to see you angry. Don't do it. Yeah, he tried to pull it with you. He tried. Yeah, it was good. Actually, there was another investor on the table, and he was like, I stood up because I left my my partner. She's she's older than me uh-huh. significantly, and I was like, you ready to go? She was like, yep. Hmm. And I got up, I shook everybody's hand, and one of the investors was like, Dominique, I fought dogs before. I've seen dogs fight. You're a pit bull. Oh. He said, I'm going to sing you deals in front of this guy. And I was like, thank you. I sure am. Looked at the guy and said, you have a great day. Wow. Yeah. See? <laughs> you got rid of some of the bad energy. Yeah. And gained someone that yeah. saw that value. So that's nice. Yes. That's nice. Stay what, true to yourself. <laughs> what about, um, you know, in this... A lot of times, like, when we're out here, sometimes I feel like people like me and you are unicorns. Like, I don't bump into a lot of people like mm-hmm. me. Like, you know, I, I can talk sports. I can do all that. But I'd rather, like, spend my time, like, doing other things, figuring out deals or, you know, trying to plot my next plan. And so when there's not a lot of your kind, 
uh, I'm not trying to be racist or anything. Like we're like aliens, right? Like who do you get to talk to to be like, man, like nobody understands me. I don't know. Maybe you do find a lot of people that understand you, but like, how is it for you? No, I definitely feel alone a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's hard because specifically in our community, there's not a lot of us. So right. it's kind of like you know, indirectly we're competing and it doesn't it doesn't have to be that way. I've reached out to plenty of women in color that are successful in real estate asking just to sit down. Mm -hmm. Um go have coffee, go get ice cream, whatever. Um and they won't. Wow. And um for me it's like I had to unfortunately I get better results with men. Mm -hmm. Um and they actually like my grit. Hmm. So, and they're willing to teach me. Um, and honestly, that's how I learned the game of real estate was through through men. And so, yeah, it sucks feeling the way that I feel sometimes. Sometimes you do feel alone. No one's willing to mentor you or guide you. I, ideally, I would want a woman that understands what it's like mm -hmm. um, in my world. But um, you going to let that break you or are you just going to keep going? You got to keep going. You know? I wonder what that is. Like, I mean, even like in music, they always say, hey, that there can only be like one female artist popping at a time. Whereas with the guys, there's a few. Yeah. And, you know, and that's always like in our culture. And I don't know. I can't speak for any other cultures because I'm not in it. But I wonder what that is. Is it just that competitive edge amongst women or I don't know? Well, I mean, we could really dive deep to that, but um, <laughs> we won't uh, do that. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast. Yeah, that's another one. Um, but I mean, it's honestly systemic. It's yeah. mindset mm -hmm. um, that does need to change. But it's hard when you when I go into rooms. I mean, if you see two of us in a room of 50, it's like, all right, mm -hmm. indirectly, either are you my friend or we're in a way competing against each other, mm. right? Because that's how kind of society has put us. Yeah, true. Well, I mean, we, we've we been down here and we're all trying to climb to the top and mm. without really the true education and tools to do so. Our education system sucks right. in our areas. Yeah, no doubt. But anyways, it's a whole different story. So I just think that um, we really have to get out of that mindset. There's enough mm. for all of us to eat. I was just going to ask you that. There's a saying that, hey, it's enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. And like, I was going to ask, you truly believe that? Mm -hmm. I do yeah. think there's fairness in that. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, I got approached... Um, from a guy that was like, let's work together. Mm -hmm. And then I asked about the split and he was like, oh, it's a three-way split between me, my partner, and you. I thought about it. First, I was like, yeah, like, cool. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, hold on, you're just giving me the deal. I'm finding the buyer. That's a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. You and your partner need to split that 50-50. Yeah, what is that partner doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. So, like, you can still, there's, there's a pie. And the pie doesn't have to necessarily be even in mm -hmm. terms of, profit right. um but acknowledging somebody's work acknowledging mm -hmm. um you know the efforts that they put into it but be fair mm -hmm. right um so i think sometimes when people hear that they think oh i gotta give my my cut i gotta give yeah. away my da 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 but mm -hmm. like okay but this guy is giving me 10 multi-family deals that i'm just pushing out it's saving me time for yeah. researching that i'm just pushing out to my investors mm -hmm. he's giving me all the numbers he's giving me all the details all i gotta do yeah. is present it why not yeah now i'm not gonna split it three ways no nah, because i'm helping good. you close the deal right who is that other what's the other guy what's his what is he bringing to the table like uh, maybe <laughs> it's just logistics i have right. no clue but i'm like it Y'all are working together to present. Right. So that's 50. And then I'm working together with my clients mm -hmm. to buy. So that's 50. Right, right. Um, so, you know, understanding like time is money and mm -hmm. freedom. And so for me, I'm willing to give, you know, away stuff. Yeah. Um, and from there, it's like you should be able to develop relationships to where you support each other. Sometimes people think that, oh, there's enough money for all of us. There's enough. Yeah, because... There could be support. Right. There could be connection. Hmm. There could be so many things that you can help build somebody else's business and empire. It doesn't necessarily have to be money. Yeah. But people are so narrow focused on helping others. Like mm -hmm. blessings happen yeah. when you give. When you give, then I, like I have this saying, like, and I tell all my clients, I'm not going to get rich off of you. Like you're one or two. Like it's not going to make or break me. But if I take care of you, my brand and my reputation right. and what's going to grow, it's going to help me grow my legacy, my bank account, et cetera. So mm -hmm. and I think a lot of times agents look at that one deal and they just look at that person as the numbers and they're like, oh, OK, I can like, OK, I'll get 15K off this deal and I can pay off my car and they start planning stuff with that. And, and that's how relationships fall apart. That's how agents get bad names. 
Um, you know, and so I think it's important like to be a people's person, understand people. Me, I genuinely want to hear your story. Like I like to talk to people and hear where they right. come from. I'm into it, right? And I think that shows versus ah, that's the dollars. I'm looking like the wolf, like ah, yeah, twenty million deal, yeah, I want that. So, um, here's my other thing. If you a young woman out there, just like you, single mom, mm-hmm. and she's thinking about real estate, mm-hmm. like, what message would you give her? Do it. Just do it, huh? You know, it's like, at the end of the day, there are a lot of agents out there, but being active is hard, right? Mm-hmm. But if you are talking to somebody every single day, real estate becomes a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Everywhere you go, mm-hmm. people should know you're in real estate. Yes. Like, I went to the park for my daughter's birthday this weekend, and one of the dads came up, I guess I met him last year, I don't mm-hmm. remember, I mean, he was like, oh, you're the real estate agent. Yes. Yeah. Every, did you hear everybody? Can you say that louder? Because the mom's back there need to hear it. You know? um, real estate is a lifestyle. You can mm-hmm. maintain your full-time job mm-hmm. and connect everything you do to real estate. Mm-hmm. People think it's separate. Now, mm. there are transactions and things that go into place and your weekends might be taken up. Bring your kids. My 11-year-old, she's like, Mom, at 16, I want to be in real estate. Mm. I'm like, that's right. You're going to come with me. You're going to learn. To get wealth, your kids, there's not an age where you can be in real estate. Mm. You don't need your license not to be in real estate. You're right. There are so many ways to make money in mm-hmm. real estate that will work for you in the long run. Mm-hmm. There is short term goals for long term gains. Mm, nice. So I think everybody, not just single moms, but everybody should be in real estate because why not? Why not? They should teach it as a curriculum in junior high. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 so. That's what you say to people. Just do it. And so many times people make excuses and they're afraid. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. Just do it. Start. And another key thing you said is position yourself as like the expert. Like everywhere I go, I talk real estate. I mean, for years I was like talking to people because I love the shit. I'm going to talk about it if you ask me. And now... I try not, I don't have to say much anymore. People will come to me like, hey, yep. how's the market? How's business? Hey, I, my friend is looking right. to sell. And, and that's the results you want. Mm-hmm. So um, looking at yourself, let's say 10 years from now, where do you see you? Um, well, before I get into that, I just want to say, I think that people need to realize that real estate isn't just buying and selling homes. Mm. So I think a lot of people don't get into it because they're they're not a people person. Mm. Um, and you can do a lot of the behind the scenes in real estate and make way more money than the nice. buyers and sellers. So I just tell people, find what fits you in that industry. It's a big industry. <laughs> um, but in 10 years, um, I plan on having... For one, I really want to teach minorities how to invest. I want to have a team of agents that think the way that I think. Mm -hmm. Um, And eventually I could just give them all my investors. Like I don't, I don't, I don't (laughs) want to do real estate like that. Um, I need, I want it to work for me. Um, That's my passive income. Right. Um, In 10 years, I plan on having my own private practice Mm -hmm. um, and doing what I love. Nice. Um, And maybe having one or two clients that I work with ideally. Um, But um, I'm, I'm, my passion is people and Mm. I I want to pour into people in every way. So. That's dope. I like that. I like that. Hey, and, um, if people wanted to follow you or contact you, like, mm-hmm. well, what's the best way? Instagram or Facebook. <laughs> Actually, let's do Instagram. <laughs> what's uh, that Instagram handle? Uniquely dot Texas dot realtor. Uniquely well, dot T-X. Texas. Yeah. Uh, What's uniquely, where, where'd that come from? Well, my name is Dominique. So, uh, you know, that's me being cool. Like, <laughs> ooh, what can I do? Uh, that fits my name. Um, but I do believe that I'm uniquely made, aren't we all? Good. Um, but, you know, I feel like I am a unicorn. I do feel different. I do have a different heart and a passion and a reason mm. behind why I like to serve others. Um, and then, um, yeah, like, mm. Man. I'm just uniquely made. Dominique, a hell of a footprint, imprint you made on, I think, our people, on me today, and Caminos. It even there made me Look remember you. your damn name. You got fluent in Spanish. Look at you. Muy poquito. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and uh, again, you all know me. I'm Andre Keith. Thank you for coming to the show. 
thank our guests. I mean, I'm sure she she'll be back when she reaches multi multi million status with the framework to teach you all how to be uniquely an agent, uniquely Texan, uniquely Dominique. And it's a wrap. 